And so let's begin in Psalm chapter 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Let's do some singing. You may be seated. Turn with me to hymn number 748. 748, on the victory side. 748. Sing this chorus two times. know that no matter how many battles we fight, Lord, that you are ultimately the victor. And so, God, I pray that we would remember that, that it's not under our own power, or our own strength, God, but it is relying on you, Lord. We know that vengeance is yours, saith the Lord. And so I just pray that we don't go through life bitter, that we don't go through angry, God, just knowing that you're right with us through it all. And so as we are here today, I pray that you would speak to hearts in the only way that you can, oh God, and that you would Help us through anything that we may be going through. I do pray that you would be uh, with the message as is uh, preached tonight, God, and that we would use it to the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First order of business is a very brief business meeting, uh, and then we'll get into our announcements before the offering. I have a letter dated April 10, 2024. Uh, this is from Cactus Point Baptist Church in Arizona. It is a letter of recommendation and it reads, Dear Pastor Lewis, this is to certify that Sabrina Doss is a member in good standing at Cactus Point Baptist Church in Levine, Arizona, and that her request uh, is given this letter affectionately recommending her to your fellowship from this church. On behalf of our church, your friend, Pastor 
what's his name? Because he signed Wendell. Okay, he signed in such a way that was hard to read. It's, yes, I see the J and I see the W. Uh, dated uh, April 10th. I need a member to recommend that we accept Sabrina Doss as a member of Cornerstone Baptist Church, JC. And then I need another member to second that. That is uh, Cornelius Wilson. And all in favor? All opposed? I'll shoot you. All right, so... You are a member of Cornerstone Baptist Church. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. We're going to go through our announcements as we prepare to take up our offering this evening. Candy sale resumes tomorrow at 830. Those of you that have asked for candy, uh, we have it. Uh, if you want to take it to your workplace, that type of thing, we have some candy here tonight, and you can do that. Pray for safety and that the children will push for their goals and learn some good lessons about hard work and stewardship along the way. And then I need, I was asked to remind the men that we need set up for the banquet. Uh, and so men, if you could help with that after the service tonight with setting up tables and chairs and whatever else needs to be done uh, so that these ladies can have the things in order uh, for this coming Friday. And the cost is $12 for the mother-daughter banquet. Please pay it if you're coming to eat please pay it, uh, and $9 for ages four and under. And uh, come looking for God to do a work in your heart. If it's just eating a meal, you could go through the drive through at Burger King. But you come, God, do a work in my heart. And um, ask the Lord to be with the guest speaker. And uh, let's also try to be a blessing to her as she seeks to be a blessing to us. This is the last uh, week for the spring push. We've had good results and I believe good fruit uh, that will remain, but uh, bus workers keep praying and working. It's exciting to see new families. One thing I noticed on Sunday, and um, it, it really isn't one single person, but it was something I noticed on Sunday that I want to uh, announce and correct. Uh, if we're praying, and, and let's say you, you have to leave out, you've got to go to the restroom, you've been called to the nursery, or you have to, you have to leave, uh, the service. If we are praying, uh, we ask at Cornerstone that we not have people walking around when we're talking to God, just out of respect for prayer. And so if you could remember that, and um, what, what I would just ask is if we're talking to the Lord, pause, and when the prayer is ended, continue on. Uh, but I don't, I, I definitely, in our church, I just don't want prayer to be a flippant thing that we just go about our business during. We stop when we talk to the Almighty, and I just want to encourage you that way and instruct you that way. Help us out with that. If you have a cell phone, please power it off. Call to Glory Devotional for the month of May is here. I want to remind you to be conversating, uh, still processing a lot of what we learned during the conference and putting together a master evangelistic plan for Cornerstone Baptist Church. Uh, a lot of the things will continue the same. Some of them will be different, but I'm excited. But one thing I want to stress, when we have visitors, really try to minister to them. Come alongside and minister to them. It definitely makes a difference. May the 12th, Mother's Day. And, of course, our big evangelistic outreach is June the 2nd. One service in the morning, a delicious meal in the afternoon, an afternoon service, and then we're done for the day but don't wait to start inviting for our 16th anniversaries. Ushers, if you'll come, camp is around the corner, June the 10th through the 14th. And uh, I, I hear there's a big group going, and I'm excited about that, excited about what the Lord can do uh, through the camping ministry coming up this June. Uh, Michael Brown, why don't you come and ask the Lord's blessing as we give to him tonight. Let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for allowing us, Lord, to come here tonight. Lord, just giving us safety, Lord, on the roads, Lord, and in our traveling. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just be with us, Lord, as we come here to hear from you. Lord, I pray, God, that we do that tonight. And Lord, that we'll take it and do something with it. Lord, I pray, Lord, for this offering, God, that you will bless it. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will continue to provide for all of our needs. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
stand for our last hymn tonight. Hymn number 742, 742, When the Lord Saved Me. 742. King James Bible. I've got two boxes of mint meltaways, and I'm going to give them away one at a time to those who correctly answer our quiz questions out loud tonight after the service. So this is to encourage you to take some notes, <coughs> excuse me, to capture some things, and when we're done, we will just go until the boxes are empty, and those that raise their hand first will be able to answer the questions from tonight's lesson. All right, it's good to see each of you back this afternoon in the house of God for this uh, Bible college session this week, really. Why we hold to the King James Bible, we're going to cover a lot of territory, the Lord willing. And we built a little bit of a foundation in the first session this morning. And in this session, we want to look at biblical presuppositions. I have them. I believe the Bible is the infallible Word of God, and I try to base everything on that. I make no apology for that. And we have to come to this issue with that kind of mindset. We can't uh, believe in biblical inspiration that God infallibly preserved, uh, inspired the word originally through the apostles and prophets and then leave that uh, uh, faith in God uh, out of the picture when we come to the issue of what has happened to the Bible. But that's what they do. That's what they textual critics do. And uh, David W. Norris said, we have a clear choice between one or one of two diverging pathways, the road of faith or the road of human reason and unbelief. Do we begin with the word of God or do we begin with the word of man? That is the choice. That is the question. And yet fundamentalist and, and fundamental Baptist who support the modern Bible versions do that on naturalistic ground, and they admit that they do that. For example, Bob Jones University uh, teacher Samuel Snater, he's critiquing here Wilbur Pickering's uh, book, uh, Defending the Majority Text, which is almost the same as, as the received text. Wilbur Pickering did some good research on that, wrote a book, good at least one book on that subject, and trying uh, to help people understand it. Well, this Bob Jones professor, Bob Jones University, says, though although Pickering has 
avoided the, an excessive reliance on theological presuppositions. Theological presuppositions means you simply believe the Bible and base your thinking on the Bible. That's a fancy term for that. And it is nevertheless, and so Pickering, he's not as biblically solid as we are, but he has written some helpful books. But he's too biblically solid on this for this professor at Bob Jones University. Nevertheless, clear that a theological presupposition essentially undergirds his entire purpose. He's criticizing the man for undergirding his position on the Bible with biblical presuppositions. A fundamental, fundamental, fundamentals of some kind. And that's what you have to do. You have to say, okay, we believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God as it was given to Paul and Moses and whatnot and John, but that's 2,000 years ago, and we've got to look at the Bible history just as another book. But it's not. It can never be. You can never come to the truth by looking at the Bible as another book in any way whatsoever. You have to have biblical presuppositions starting with God. We'll look at this a little bit. The thing, we, we think about Edward F. Hills. Now, Edward F. Hills helped me a lot when I was first looking into this issue and, and trying to figure out what was right and what was wrong and uh, what to follow in my ministry as a young missionary. Big issue. I've got to make a decision here. Or do I say it's not an issue? And therefore, it doesn't really matter. I had, I had to figure that out. And uh, one man that really helped me was Edward F. Hills. And he was a Presbyterian, scholarly man. And he uh, was trained under B.B. Warfield and some, some men like that. And they had this strong position that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. They wrote some strong... Uh, Defense of the inspiration of the Bible, verbal inspiration, plenary inspiration. But when it, but then they started, but then they followed Westcott and Hort when it came to the transmission and preservation of the text. That's how he was trained, and he went to Harvard University, Edward F. Hills, and studied textual criticism at the highest level, Ph.D. level, at Harvard University. It doesn't get any higher than that in America. And he was presented with this thing that, that I'm going to treat the Bible like another book. And Edward F. Shills could not accept that, and he rejected that, and therefore became a scholarly pariah, because that's what you'll be if you don't follow the scholarly line. And he was willing to bear that reproach, and, and he wrote some excellent books, especially two, uh, uh, that really helped me, but he refused to give up his biblical presuppositions. I have 11 here in regard to this issue. Number one, I believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of Scripture. I am sure that God gave the Bible by the words, not just the thoughts, that He gave the whole Bible, that God planned the Bible before the world was made. God saw this book before it was given piece by piece to those holy prophets that the Word of God is settled in heaven and given to these holy men and every word, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2. I love this passage on biblical inspiration. Do use your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's a major passage on biblical inspiration. We could look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We could look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. These major passages. Well, we're not teaching uh, a whole subject on inspiration right now, but this passage, verbal inspiration right here. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, 
comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And he's talking about his own writings under divine inspiration. That's the subject here. If we go back up to um, verse 9, we could go further up, but verse 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us. So he's talking about revelation. He's not talking about the fact that we don't yet know everything in, that's in heaven. We don't. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about things that are revealed, that they're not revealed by man. They're revealed by the Spirit of God. He's talking about divine inspiration and revelation here. And his own writings and the, and then of the other apostles and prophets of the New Testament. The modernistic view is that they didn't know that they were giving, they didn't know that they were writing under divine inspiration and that the churches didn't receive it as divine inspiration. That's a lie and that's proven right here. But also the words, he said the words, which things we speak, verse 13, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. So he's talking about words, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Ah, Holy Spirit words. Yes, that's the Bible. That's the only right view of the Bible. The only right view, divinely inspired, planned in heaven before it was given. It's an eternal book. This book's going to be open at the, at the uh, Great White Throne Judgment. This is an eternal book. It, every word of it was given by divine inspiration, not, not just the general thoughts. That's the only right view of the Bible. That's the view that I hold. Anything that is contrary to that is absolutely false and of the devil. I, that's my presupposition. And you can't talk me out of it. Because it's based on truth. There are a thousand reasons why I believe that. Number two, I believe in the divine inspiration of script, preservation of Scripture. Preservation. Oh, yes, a thousand evidences for the divine inspiration. Amazing. But the divine preservation. Thy word is true, Psalm 119, verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Eternal words. Preserved words. Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, the little tiny parts of a Hebrew letter, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Can't happen. Can't be destroyed. Preserved of God. An eternal book preserved of God. In spite of all the vicious attacks, Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Eternal book. Eternal book. And we give some other references there. But I believe that. That is, that I believe it for sure. And any theory that says or implies that God has not preserved the scriptures is false presupposition based on God's word. Number three, I believe in the sufficiency of scripture. In a world of unbelief, I believe. And I'm so thankful for that. 50 years ago, I didn't. I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, not only the divine inspiration and the divine preservation, but the sufficiency means I have in here everything that I have, I need for faith and practice, the Christian life and in the church and in the family. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. A lot of people say, well, where's the Bible say that? Well, it says it right here. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Because the Roman Catholic Church doesn't believe this. Ah, but the Bible teaches it. 
2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, all, and is profitable for doctrine. I love doctrine. For reproof. I need reproof. For correction. need that too. For instruction in righteousness, practical instruction, how to live. How I love the book of Proverbs, for example. What a practical book of wisdom. Yeah, but then it says that the man of God may be perfect, perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Well, if, if there's a book, all Scripture, that is able to make me perfect, truly furnished, that's the meaning of perfect there. The Bible's a self-interpreting book. Then what else do I need? Nothing, of course. Therefore, I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. I can test everything by it. And if anything is contrary to it, it's wrong. And the Bible's right. So I'm not, I'm not dependent at the end of the day on scholars or priests or anything like that. Number four, I believe in the sole liberty of the believer, meaning that each believer can know the truth for himself and is responsible to test everything by God's Word. And uh, we've looked at two passages already pertaining to that. Acts 17, 11, the Bereans, the Bereans, and they received the Word with all readiness of mind, and they tested everything by the Scriptures. That's what this means, soul liberty. It means that God has given me what I need to test things so that I will not be deceived. 1 John 2, 20, excuse me, 1 John 2, 27. The child of God can make his own decision on the important matters like Bible version issue. God's given us enough. And God's prepared, given us His Spirit, given us His Word, so we can settle these things. We're not ultimate. We need men, but we're not ultimately dependent on men. That's what this verse means. 1 John 2, 27, But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you, and so the Spirit of God, when you're saved, when you trust Christ, Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, you're sealed with that Spirit. And Paul said, if you have not the Spirit of God, you're none of His. So it abides in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. Really? I thought I need teachers. You do. And uh, each passage has to be interpreted by its own context. But here it's talking about these false teachers, these uh, antichrists, already. That's the subject of 1 John 2. And they, and they were already plaguing the churches. And John is writing to warn and to protect the believers. And he said, you have the Spirit of God. You have an anointing. You have an inner teacher. That's one of the main ministries of the Holy Spirit is he's my teacher. Because I can't understand this book without him is help. Not at all. I don't care how smart you are. In other areas, you can't understand this book without a spiritual teacher. And God has given him, and he lives in the believer, and that's what it's talking about, and it's, it's for protection. And ultimately, we can test false things and be protected from them. Baptists call it soul liberty to test things, to have the authority, to have the ability. And so I can deal with this issue. God says I can deal with this issue, any fundamental issue. I can deal with it. Number five, I believe in the simplicity of sound doctrine. Simplicity of sound doctrine. Matthew eleven twenty five. Love this verse. Matthew eleven twenty five. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. 
Jesus said, it is enough, I'm sorry, 1125, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. I thank the Lord, too, for that, because that's all I am, just a babe, and hidden them from the wise and prudent. A divine hiding. Why? Because of pride. If you don't throw away your pride, you'll never get saved, and you'll never understand the Word of God. You've got to throw it away. You've got to come as a child, except to be converted and become as a little child. Then you, you can't see the kingdom of God, Matthew 18, 3. Yeah, I believe in the simplicity of sound doctrine. Because God mostly saves simple people. Just look around. And mostly does. In any biblical church down through history, doctrine is simple. It's got to be. There's a basic simplicity to the truth. And if it's ultra complicated, now there's a lot of hard things in the Bible. But at, at fundamentally, Bible truth is simple enough for young people to understand, for just barely educated people to understand. And that's why we can go to these countries where, I mean, a lot of our people can't read, cannot read. The older ones that got saved later. Ah, but I can teach them simple Bible truth. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen, God hath chosen. God chooses things. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which, uh, which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, are that, this is the purpose, that no flesh should glory in his presence and none will. And so because of the uh, simpleness of the people that are usually saved. Paul was an exception. Paul was a great scholar. Peter was a fisherman. John was just a fisherman. And that's normal. But when you come to Calvinism, for example, it's very complicated. And, and uh, invariably, if you reject Calvinism, they'll say, you just don't understand it. Well, I've given my best shot at it, and if I still don't understand it, then it's too complicated. And the same is true for textual criticism. To understand textual criticism properly, you've got to understand things like conflation, recension, inversion, conjectural emendation. Do you understand conjectural emendation? Intrinsic and transcriptional probability? interpolation, statistical probability, harmonistic assimilation, cognate groups, hypothesized intermediate archetypes, and other things. Now imagine me coming here trying to teach that this week. And you'd have good reason to be bored then. Well, here's, here's a statement. Now, A.T. Robertson was a Baptist scholar, a Greek scholar, definitely a scholarly man. Here's what he says. Here, here's what he taught. In actual practice, appeals should first be made to the external evidence of the documents by first coming to understand the value of internal evidence of single readings. It will be seen that we have to consider the internal evidence of single readings the internal evidence of classes of documents. That way of putting it appears paradoxical. 
but it is literally true that the scientific use of the external evidence turns on the application of the principles of internal evidence as seen in single readings. You want me to go on? Do you understand what he's saying? Not a word. Not a word. And imagine how long it would take him to explain to you what he's trying to say. More than the time, 15 sessions we have together, just to explain that paragraph. That's too complicated. That can't be the truth. Number six, presuppositions. I believe that all things should be done unto edifying. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Very important passage. This is about the church and the services in particular. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. The main theme of 1 Corinthians 14 is not tongues or prophecy. It is edifying. Everything must edify. And this is the, the theme. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you hath a song, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. The word means to build up spiritually, to build up, build up the Christian life, to build up the Christian home, to build up the church, to build up spiritually toward that perfect man in Christ, build up, edify. There's nothing that should be done that doesn't edify. Nothing. Nothing's for entertainment. Only edification. And all teaching. It's not just to be interesting or some other reason. It must edify. It must build up the Christian life. It's not just intellectualism. Nothing should be dealt with on that level. Nothing at all. It must edify. That's what Paul said. We could look at these other verses. For example, Ephesians chapter 4. This is repeated in this chapter. This chapter, Ephesians 4, is one of the places where we see a New Testament church in a nutshell, a summary, brief summary of a New Testament church. God can put immensely complicated things into a few words and even simple words although they're infinite in teaching but chapter 4 verses 11 through 16 there's a New Testament church and it begins with the right leaders and the right leaders build up the body so that each member can uh, participate in building the church for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everything is to edify. Verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together, talking about a New Testament church, and compacted by that which every joint, every joint, every single member supplieth. And God decides what part you are. We don't choose that. We cannot choose our calling, our place in the church, uh, our gifting, none of that. We have no choice over that. Just like a, a joint in your has no choice over that. God chose that. Every joint, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, every one, every individual, making the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And then verse 4, 29. 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Everything is to edify. And uh, any biblical research that does not result in spiritual edification is wrong. There's no place for just intellectualism. It must spiritually build up, edify, convict all the elements of that, all the elements of edifying, all the elements of biblical re of preaching, reprove, rebuke, exhort, doctrine. 
everything. And, and that means if you, re if you read the books on te textual criticism, they don't edify. It's pure intellectualism. It's not even designed to edify. They don't, they're not talking about what kind of Christian life you live or uh, the separation from sin or anything like that. Your husband-wife relationship, it's just all intellectualism. It can't be right. Number seven, I believe in the reality of the devil. I really do. That's got to be a fundamental part of your worldview if you're a, a Bible-believing Christian. There is a devil. There is a devil. Be sober, be vigilant. 1 Peter 5, 8. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil, there is a devil. We're told quite a bit about him in the Bible. We know his origin as, a, as the anointed cherub that covereth the highest angel, apparently, and how he became proud and decided he was going to be uh, rebel against God and how that many angels followed him in that rebellion and that there's rulers and principalities of the spiritual darkness of this world that there's two spiritual kingdoms operating in this world there's the kingdom of light the kingdom of god and the kingdom of the devil they're not equal in power but they are operating and every lost person is under the control of the devil according to ephesians 2 2 we're told a lot about him and he's not in hell. He is on earth. He has access to heaven still, apparently. We see him there talking with God in Job. But he's walking about. He is your adversary. If you're saved, you have an adversary, whether you want it or not. So you better learn to deal with it. And he's walking about, and he's seeking whom he may devour. And I don't want to be devoured. I believe this. I understand this. One of the first thoughts I had when I got saved was, man, I've been controlled by the devil. In the history of the New Testament, John Burgon, who wrote great books on the defense of the King James Bible, the text underlying the King James Bible, the history of the New Testament text is the history of a conflict between God and Satan. Yes, thank you, John Burgon. He understood that. This is not just men quabbling about things. This is a spiritual issue. One of the devil's chief goals since the Garden of Eden was to corrupt the Word of God. That's the first thing we see him doing. He chose Eve. She was the weaker one. Adam never was deceived. It's a strange situation. He was there. He chose her. He targeted her. And he came and he said, Hath God said? He talked, he had her thinking about the Word of God. She should have said, Yes, he has. He has? And go talk to Adam. She didn't say that. The devil questioned God's Word. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Galatians 3. No, Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 1. He questioned. This is the main work of the devil, is to mess with God's Word. How can the devil not be in the Bible text version issue? It's not possible. But you'll, never, you'll not read any books on textual criticism that even mention the devil. How, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and he's presenting himself as Eve's good friend, as he does. I'm your good friend. Let me talk to you. Don't talk to the devil. She shouldn't have talked to the devil. But the devil wants to talk to you. The devil wants to talk to me. I'm a preacher. The devil wants to talk to me about the Word of God. He wants to have a conversation with me about the Word of God. Definitely. He, 
he questioned it. Hath God said, what is God saying here? That's the first step toward apostasy is start questioning things. Be careful about questions. You, you have to live by faith. God said that uh, without faith, it's impossible to please him. You're not going to be able to answer every question that comes up. How could you? You're just a puny person. We're just puny persons with a puny little mind, and we barely know anything. Basically, that's what we are. How in the world could we expect to answer all the big questions and all the questions that the devil could ask? And he's still asking lots of questions. Be content with what God said. That's what she should have done. No, she didn't. He questioned. The Bible's questioned on every hand today. Every person is going to be confronted with this and have to make choices about this. All over the world, people take for granted that the Bible has been disproven as the Word of God. They take that for granted. It has not. No one's ever disputed, disproven anything in the Bible, actually. The evidence is massive, overwhelming that the Bible is the Word of God and his, historically accurate. Overwhelming. But the lie has been promoted for so long and so widely, most people in the world take it for granted that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, if they know anything. And, you know, those miracles weren't really true. Sodom and Gomorrah were not really destroyed by fire out of heaven. Maybe it was an earthquake and something like that. But Jonah wasn't really swallowed by a whale. There wasn't a worldwide flood. The devil's questions. If you're young, you're going to be confronted with all this stuff. He questioned the Word of God. He denied the Word of God in verse 4. In Genesis 4, 3, verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. Well, you lying thing, you. What happened to Eve? She died. She's dead. Adam and Eve got saved. If you're saved, you'll see them one day, but they're dead. He's a liar. Openly denied it, but first he questioned it. And then he substituted his own words for God's. Verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's the theme of rock and roll. Ye shall be as gods. Do your own thing. Well, who do you think you are? God. So he substituted his own words. And that's the process. And it's the process the devil has found successful for 6,000 years. Worked well. Don't need to change the thing. And he's, he's wormed his way beginning in the, well, the 1800s. And the, and the seminaries and Bible colleges all over the world. With the questions. And then the denials. And then the substitutions. So that most people that claim to be Christian today, most churches, most schools, don't believe the Bible. That's a fact. Did you know that? That's an absolute fact. You need to know that in fact. So, I believe in the devil. I'm going to be on the lookout for the devil. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to protect myself from the devil. And my family, and my grandkids, too. Yeah. Biblical presupposition. Number eight, I believe in the doctrine of apostasy. Oh, man. I just finished the course. haven't published it yet. And the tentative title is The Little Known But Essential Doctrine of Apostasy. I might find something a little shorter. I don't know. But that captures it. The Little Known But Essential Doctrine in, in Apostasy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Here's, here's a major passage. Here's, a, here's the doctrine of apostasy summarized. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come, to, written 2,000 years ago by Paul, to Timothy, the preacher, for the time will come, when they will not endure sound doctrine, 
but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now here's the doctrine of apostasy summarized. God summarizes these major doctrines in certain passages and puts it all right there. But actually it's infinite in its teaching if you break it down. But he said the time will come. So this is coming. It's a prophecy. They, but he's talking about professing Christians. He just, he just talked about preaching, verse 2. So he's, it, the context is Christians, churches, preaching the word. That's the context. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So apostasy is not an ignorance problem. It's a heart problem. I don't like sound doctrine. Sound doctrine interferes with how I live. Yes, it does. Big time. Because it's God's doctrine. And God can tell me how to live. But lost man doesn't like that. To be told how to live by God. So I, so I reject the sound doctrine which comes to me with authority. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And so they want teachers, they want Christianity, but a different kind. Not this sound doctrine authoritative kind that messes with how I live, but a new kind. And so their ears are itching for that. Who's going who's gonna to give me that kind? Ah, there's most heaps, heaps of teachers are going to fulfill that need. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. So again, it's a will. It's a matter of the will, not of the, ignor of the mind and ignorance. It's a willful rejection. Lots of kids in church do this. It happens all the time. Hearing the word of God and sitting there and rejecting it. You, and you don't have to totally reject it you can just ignore it let it it's not for, I'm not interested that was me as a kid in Ch Baptist Church I don't ever remember just you know harden myself totally rejecting I believed in Jesus never doubted him but I just let it fly by I didn't care about it not a bit and so turn away the ears from the truth refuse to hear it and then it says, shall be turned into fables. So if I turn myself from the truth, if I reject it, then I am going to be operated on. It says, be turned to. That's someone operating or something operating on me. That's the devil. To fables. There's no telling where you'll end up if you reject the truth. There's no telling where you'll end up. You can be an atheist. No telling where you'll end up. You can be, no telling. And that's, that, that's a teaching that we could go on. There's a study here. It's a doctrine. It's a warning of the Bible. And that, that it will progress through the church age. And the farther we get toward the end of the age, the darker the apostasy will be, the more complete the apostasy will be, the more of a majority of churches will be apostate. That's where we are. Very few Bible-believing churches in the world. Very few. Very few. And that's a fact. But it's prophesied in the Scripture. Should not be surprising at all. So I, when I look at these last couple hundred years of history as we're entering the last hours of the age, I'm not going to expect a lot of truth. I'm not going to expect biblical scholars to be biblical. I'm going to expect them to be off base because I'm told that this would happen and guess what it's exactly what we see especially since the 1800s and as we're going to see this week this whole modern version thing it's all following and issuing from apostasy number nine I believe in the preeminence of faith you've got to base everything on faith faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God can only come to truth in this issue by faith. Number 10, I believe in trembling before God's word. Trembling. You'll never come to the truth if you don't tremble before God's word. This is the word of God. 
Yeah, this is not just an ordinary book. This is the word of the living God. I've got to exercise extreme caution in handling it and in how anybody else handles it. Number 11, finally, I believe in the necessity of the Holy Spirit. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we, we can know nothing about the Bible. This is a repetition from what we said earlier. The necessity of the Holy Spirit. And so biblical presuppositions as we come to any, any subject, but you can't have biblical presuppositions unless you are a solid biblical person. You can't. How can you? And if you just sit and listen to sermons, and that's all you do, and maybe read the Bible some, you're not a solid biblical person. It doesn't happen like that. It requires a lot more energy zeal and work than that. Know the answer. Number one, what are biblical presuppositions? Justine. Loud and clear. They start with God. You haven't defined what they are. What are biblical presuppositions? Monique. The Bible is entirely God, every word given, entirely and Correct. Believing the Bible is the word of God and basing everything on the Bible. Number two, you can't come to the truth, treating the Bible like what? Crystal. Just another book and just another history book. Crystal Brown. Number three, should the Bible version issue be a big deal? Lois, yes. Don't forget you answered that question. Number four, God didn't just give the thoughts, he gave what? crystal the words after you taste some of that delicious chocolate if you want to purchase some from cornerstone baptist academy just see one of our students number five first corinthians 2 13 uses what important verbal inspiration in the plural what important verbal inspiration word in the plural some of these questions are easy some of them are hard 1 Corinthians 2.13 uses what important verbal inspiration word in the plural? Alice. Yes. Okay, but I'm, I'm pointing out, that's true, I'm pointing out one verse in the Bible that uses suppositions. No. Alex, what word? You raise your hand. No, it's in the plural. We, I guess, uh, um, yeah. Um, who was next? Okay, hold on, Barbara. No. Jamari. No, is that First Corinthians two thirteen? What important word is used in the plural? Lois. Words, N not just the thoughts. You can do some pretty amazing gymnastics with translation if you're just concerned about the thoughts. Okay, those that understand languages understand what I'm saying. If you speak another language or if you understand how languages work, if you're just trying to get the thought across, you can, you can say different words. Um, and you may or may not be getting the thought across. But God didn't just give the thoughts. He gave the exact words. Very important. Number six. Will any part of God's words pass away? Justine. Correct. Number seven. Define for me the divine sufficiency of scripture. 
the divine suffic the sufficiency of scripture. Dominique. Yes, in the Bible, we have everything that we need and we can test everything by the scriptures. Number eight, what is, this is important for the Baptist faith, what is the sole liberty of the believer? Um, Amira. Okay, we can know the truth for ourselves, and we can test everything by the scripture. That is correct. Number nine. What did John tell the believers that they possessed? What did John, Monique? Yes, the spirit. To do what? Jamari. No, Monique. That is correct. Number 10. What must you throw away in order to understand your Bible? Addie. Your pride, that is correct. Number 11, what should always be simple enough to understand? Zoe, the Bible, biblical truth. Number 12, all biblical teaching must do what? Uh, Mr. Murray, edify, it must build up. And that's a good uh, point to remember as people want to argue with you over various words and things in the Bible that don't profit, that want to just pick an argument and argue on something that doesn't really edify? Did Adam have a belly button? That kind of stupidity. If it doesn't edify, leave it alone. Number 13, who decides what part you play in the church? Amanti. God. God. Number 14, who is real? Justine, the devil. The devil. 15, who controls every lost man? Monique, the devil. That is correct. I'm watching my best to see who's raising their hands up first. This is important. 16, what has been Justine? We're going to take one away if it's not right. Okay, we'll try it again. I'm going to ask it again. What has been Satan's chief goal? Monique? To corrupt the word of God. Okay, so that started in the garden. So we should not be surprised if he wants to do it today. That's what he's always done. Okay. Number 17. What has never been disproven? Mocha. Alex. The word of God. The word of God. Very important to understand the modern Bible version, version issue in the garden what did Satan substitute a Sean? His own words for God's words. That is correct. 19. What is Amira? What is apostasy? <laughs> you can tell these kids have been Bible quizzing. All right. Wait, no, 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 no. Don't give it to her yet. What is apostasy? No. That is incorrect. Um, and, and everybody wants to know what this is. You want to know what this is. Jamari, what's apostasy? It's the leaving of the truth. And as he pointed out, it is a willful decision to leave the truth. You have two more? Okay. We'll, have, we'll give one to our candy passer outer, so you can have one. And then number 20, what are people's ears itching for? Justine, what they wanna hear. I, I like that, but I need something a little bit more substantive. Uh, Julian, yeah, false teaching. 
unsound doctrine. Get it to him. And we'll get it to our prayer. Thank you for viewing our live stream.